Okay, we're on the air. Everyone all set. I'll call the London Dairy Planning Board meeting to order for April 12th, 2023. I want to point out for everyone who is here, this room has two exits. They're on the right-hand side of the audience. They're at the front of the room and the back of the room. If we have to evacuate for any reason, we ask you to proceed through the exit closest to you, go outside, move away from the building, and don't come back into our fire officials have instructed us to do so. I'd like to ask everyone to please rise and pledge allegiance to the American flag. Okay, we've got a uh, full complement of uh, regular members. We have a full complement now of uh, our ex officios. Uh, and uh, Bruce, if you squeeze up in, uh, oh, up in here. That gives us nine voting members. Uh, we have a quorum and uh, we can uh, proceed. Uh, tonight, the first part of the meeting is administrative board work. Then we get into old business. There's new plans, concept or conceptual discussion. Uh, old business, but what I'm going to do is move up to the first spot is uh, Woodmont Commons annual update. Uh, I think this is probably the uh, most important part. Uh, we have this every uh, every year. So, uh, you doing the honors, Kevin, for the uh, update? I'll give it. Part, pardon? Uh, part of it. Part of it. And uh, you've got a, a Hable assistant there, or is it the other way around? <laughs> I just want to make sure she can she hear can hear us, us and, uh, and see what she needs to see it'll be on the uh, on a screen and w we have the, uh, the hard copy uh, here also board members ha have it so this is an annual experience for us uh, Woodmont gives us an update uh, they have to show that they're also either tax positive or uh, tax negative. Uh, if it is tax negative, they owe the town uh, money. That has not happened. And uh, reading through this report, it hasn't happened yet. So, uh, And I think some of the things that we need to probably know is, is uh, what has been accomplished. I know uh, Kevin has been uh, updating some of us regularly anyway. If you're tuned into uh, Facebook and Woodmont Commons. And also, what is the plan for the uh, for the future? So we know what is uh, coming down the line. At least what you can uh, talk about, anyway. You can always talk about it in generalities. So. <laughs> is it Lucy on uh, online? Uh, I'm just going to see if she can actually hear us. Oh, okay. Lucy, can you hear us? Sounds like typical Zoom. Sometimes you can hear them, can't see them, or it's the other way around. Your number? Yeah, Lu Lucy is very good with the uh, the, the <coughs> numbers. Uh, the first first year for this was a bit of an effort to come up with the the formulas because what we're looking for is the continuity. So what's done in the first year is the same as the second, third, fourth, fifth years. Somebody's phone. Yeah, so they're calling you. Lucy Gallo. Hey, Lucy. This is the town of Londonderry. Can you hear us? Um, I cannot. Yeah, okay. So, well, we see you. So we saw you briefly. <laughs> Okay, let me see. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Loud and clear. Can she hear us? Can you hear us, Lucy? Can no. Hear us? Maybe not. Hmm. Sorry. Same, you promising for a moment there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she is on the, on the bottom corner. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I see some warning symbols on your audio. Oh. Hey, Ari. I'm going to take you off speaker so we can hear you through the Zoom. Okay. I'm not sure you can hear us through the Zoom. Let me ask somebody to speak into the microphone. Yeah, I, I, I actually have a live stream on, so I can hear you through that. Uh, so I'm going to turn my phone off and, and see how that works. Okay, super. That should work. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? 
Yep. Yes. Can you hear us? Wait a minute. It's going to be a pause. Can you hear me? Yes. Do we got the light on the screen? We can. What can she see? She doesn't necessarily hmm. need to be seen. The phone will be quicker than the live stream. And the live stream is going to have a delay. Uh, so we would She's muted right now. Oh, you're muted. Right now. Right now. Can you hear me now? Yes. We can hear you, but I don't think you're hearing me. Oh. Uh, oh. <coughs> Getting feedback. You can feed the feedback. Yeah. All right. I'll mute you. All right. I'll mute you. Um, so uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, both the town and the school district staff for being such a big help. We've had some new people involved in the process this year. Um, uh, Perone and Lisa McKinney from the school district is their first uh, adventure with the, uh, the fiscal update. And as always, Mr. Justin um, Campo, his efforts are very much appreciated. So I'm going to turn to page four of the report. And um, on page four and five, uh, there's a description of the annual fiscal update process that embodies in the development agreement. She's voice has died out. Hello. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Okay, there's a there's a delay in in um, when I speak in, in the report. Um so I think that we are now on um, uh, page five. And just as a um, conclusion that the purpose of the analysis is to compare the revenues and incremental general fund expenditures for the measurement period July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2022. So if the board has any questions, just uh, raise your hands. Okay. All right. So um, on page five, we report that we have uh, at June 30th, 2022, there are approximately 229 residents as opposed to 179 residents in um, 2022. On page six, um, table two, there were approximately 71 employees. Uh, at uh, June 30th, 2022. Moving over to page seven, and we'll look I just, at I just, table three. I just uh, wanted we'll to see the uh, assessment value as of April 1, 2021. I just want uh, yeah, I wanted okay. to, just wanted to know. I just picked it up uh, in table two. The uh, six 600 brewery as uh, a typo there. It's significant, but it probably does make a difference. Okay. So um, I'm on uh, table three now. 
And to estimate the annual property tax revenue as of June 30th, 2022, we used the $76 million assessed value as of April 1, 2021. And that yielded an annual property tax revenue of $317,000. Again, I'm looking at Table 3. So cumulatively, the project has generated $1.9 million in property tax revenue for the town since June 30th, 2022. Through June 30th, 2022. Further down on Page 7 is a discussion about our incremental operating expenditures. Again, we're closely with the town to identify operating capital expenditures that were allocable to the project. On Page 8, at the top of the page, Table 4, this is an annual analysis where we compare full-time positions, essentially town staff, to understand if the town has experienced any growth in personnel. That's typically an indicator of incremental expenditures. To date, that there have been no incremental operating expenditures associated with Woodmont Commons that would be allocable to the town. From a capital standpoint, every year we do a close look at capital acquisitions to determine if there are any capital items that should be allocated to the project. Thus far, the only capital item that has been allocated is shown in Table 5, and that is where annually we're allocating the cost of the central fire department's fire station debt service to the project, and that's about $4,000 a year. So on Page 9 under Table 6, we have would be our summary report for the net fiscal impact of the project. You can see for the year ended June 30, 2022, we had annual property tax revenue of $317,000, motor vehicle permit fee revenues of around $42,000, for total revenues of almost $359,000, reduced by the allocation of debt service related to the fire station for annual net revenues of approximately $355,000. So based on the findings in this report, there are no amounts due to the town under the terms of the development agreement. Turning to Page 10 is the analysis of the London Dairy School District. In the first paragraph, we identified that 16 public school children were living in Woodmont Commons during the fiscal 2022 year. In the prior year, fiscal 2021, there were 14 students, so we had a net gain of two additional students. A summary of the net fiscal impact to the school district is shown in Table 7. So for fiscal year 2022, the project generated $897,000 in property tax revenue, but there were no incremental operating or capital expenditures assignable as a result of Woodmont Commons, so that there was in fact a net operating revenue of $897,000 for the school district. And again, that's just summarized again on Page 11 under the incremental operating capital expenditures. We go through a similar process with the school district that we do with the town in evaluating whether or not there were any incremental operating or capital costs that would be assignable. In case you're interested, on Page 15 under Appendix Table 1, there's a supporting schedule of the list of all tax parcels in Woodmont Commons and their valuation as of April 1, 2021 is shown on Page 15. So the total assessed value at that date was the $76.2 million, which I referenced earlier. Just a quick note on the bald one, it is still construction, as you all know, is ongoing and working towards school completion or working towards a fall 2023 opening. 
So we're uh, still ways from uh, the incremental values uh, showing up on the, the tax rolls, but that will, will be our, uh, just around the corner. And uh, on page 16, uh, it's just a comparison of the assessed values on April 1st, 2022. So those tax revenues will be then recognized in the uh, 2023 uh, fiscal update. So the report that would be prepared as of June 30th, 2023. On page 17, as I mentioned earlier, uh, every year we go through a listing of the town's capital additions um, and work with the finance staff to identify any that might be allocable to the project. So this is just a summary of the, the uh, capital assets we evaluated this year and the conclusions they are. So I apologize for having technical difficulties, but um, uh, if there are any questions, I'll be able to answer them now. Board have any questions? I don't see any here. Uh, okay, Lucy, can you hear me? I can. Okay, there aren't any questions at the moment. This is a bit of a difficult interaction. Yeah. So it's here too. Uh, you have questions on the board in the last couple of weeks. That'd be perfect. And I think we'll just connect it before I just turn off. Thank you, and I apologize for having trouble tonight. Thank you. That's my, probably my error. Yeah. The, uh, the electronic age. <laughs> Yes, because we certainly appreciate, I, I know Lucy does very, uh, very thorough work. So it's, and the board has had this uh, since, uh, I think uh, Kelly had mail, emailed it out Monday for the board to re review. But it's, it's very similar to past years, other than the numbers uh, have changed and the formulas are all the same. Kevin, you look very familiar to us. <laughs> Back again, second week in a row. <laughs> Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the record, my name is Kevin Smith, and I'm here in the capacity as a consultant to the Woodmont Commons Project this evening. Obviously, Woodmont is a project I'm uh, intimately familiar with. Uh, I believe the PUD was signed uh, by the planning board uh, shortly after I was hired back in 2013, and believe the project had a lot of promise back then and still believe it has a, a lot of promise today, which is why I'm excited to be uh, working on it in a different capacity. Uh, and to Ari's chagrin, I gave him the night off, so you get to hear from me tonight. I <laughs> uh, just want to give a very brief update on some things going on up there. Um, as you know, there's a few developments that will be opening this year. Uh, the first being Dairy Medical Center, uh, which is slated to open in May. Uh, and then, of course, the Baldwin uh, Independent Living Community, uh, which is looking to open the uh, first phase of its uh, project in October. There are just some pictures. I'm sure all of you who have traveled down Michael's Way have uh, seen this. There's the, the rear side of uh, Dairy Medical I have to tell you, kudos to the planning board because it was all of you who got this uh, brick wall to uh, be put in and I think has uh, made a very nice touch. Between the Heritage Commission and, and, and this, uh, this board, it, uh, it was a, a good effort. Yeah, really, really makes that lot uh, <laughs> pop out there. And these are just some uh, photos of the construction ongoing at the Baldwin uh, this is looking at it from the north end. That's a picture of their uh, glass skywalk that will be connecting the two uh, buildings to one another, the pedestrian cross. That will help the seniors with their balance. <laughs> Not only that, they won't have to go out in the snow when yes. they want to get to the community center. And that's looking in at their uh, main entrance there off of uh, Woodmont Way. Uh, what's in the pipeline? Uh, Wood Partners, um, they continue to go through a uh, design review uh, with the town. I know they've been to uh, Heritage Commission. 
Uh, they're uh, slated upon approval to build 260 uh, apartments uh, on the west side. Uh, Derry Medical Center is uh, getting ready to submit a site plan and subdivision for their second uh, medical office uh, that will be entirely leased by uh, a very well-known medical user. Uh, uh, and uh, they'll, they will reveal to the board who that is, uh, but they're very excited about it. We're excited about it. Uh, so they'll be submitting very soon. And then uh, phase two of the Baldwin. Um, so if you recall, they're building initially about 260 units at full build out. It'll be 290. Um, they are entirely full at this point uh, and they have a waiting list. Uh, so uh, they'll be coming forward with a phase two of their project uh, sooner than later um, after they're open. Quite, quite popular. Very popular, <clears throat> yep. And this is just uh, conceptual uh, to get you familiar with where Derry Medical is going to be putting their second uh, medical office building. Uh, it'll be right at the end of Main Street, uh, just beyond Woodmont Avenue there. Um, and that'll be a, somewhere between 30 and uh, 40,000 square foot building, mostly brick facade. Uh, and then behind that, there is space for uh, a hotel, five-story hotel pad. Uh, which leads me into coming attractions. Uh, we're aggressively pursuing retail and restaurants. Um, obviously, on the west side, we know that the community wants it. Uh, and so we're, uh, as I said, aggressively going after those uses. We've been talking to a number of hotel developers uh, about putting a hotel there. Obviously, they want to see the density uh, to support that. And then uh, additional uh, residential on Main Street, similar to the mixed-use building uh, that is already there with the commercial on the bottom and uh, residential on the top floors. And the east side is now coming along, too. On the other side of 93, exit 4A is well underway. Uh, they're making great headway with the construction there. Uh, the first phase is slated to be completed uh, at, in the fourth quarter of 2024. Uh, and because that uh, construction is now happening, we've been getting many inquiries from uh, a lot of uh, larger users um, for that particular site. Uh, if you recall, that opens up about 200 acres uh, of developable land. Could I ask a question? Yes, uh, Ann. Did you lose any um, any acreage with the expansion of 93 and um, um, exit 4A going in there or um, the new um, lines put in by Eversource? Did you lose any acreage to development? No, I mean, the only acreage that's lost is where the roadway is going in, Old Rum Trail. Okay. Uh, you know, that's bifurcating the property uh, in half. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I don't think there was much acreage lost with the uh, I-93 expansion. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, we're working on some permitting issues uh, on the west side. We're just finalizing a consumer uh, capacity agreement uh, with the town uh, so that there's uh, adequate sewer to serve uh, the in entirety of the west side, both north and south of Pillsbury Road. Uh, so that will be served by both uh, Derry and Manchester. And as you are all well aware, uh, Penichuk Water was in here uh, permitting their water tank, uh, transmission line, and pump station, uh, all of which we anticipate will be uh, built uh, in 2024. And on the east side, uh, we're also doing a lot of uh, permitting on there to get that area ready for uh, development as well. Um, first and foremost is delivering water and gas to that side. Believe it or not, the most expeditious way it appears to do it at this point is to bring it in from the west side and bore under 93 uh, and bring it over that way. So that will require coordination with both the town and with uh, New Hampshire DOT, we actually have a meeting next week with, with DOT, as well as Liberty, Penichuk, uh, and the town. Um, we're coordinating, again, with uh, DOT and the town uh, for the location of the curb cuts that will be coming off of Old Rum Trail and the placement of the utility sleeves for such. Uh, we're working with the town and DES uh, for a permit for a construction haul road 
uh, which we anticipate will be approximately located directly opposite of where Londonderry Ro Road is, and that would be for construction purposes. Uh, and then there is the relocation of the power lines uh, over on the east side, uh, <clears throat> and we're coordinating that with uh, Eversource. And that's it. Okay, a lot going on. Any questions from the board? I think Mr. Smith might have skipped a slide at the end. Oh, hold on. Yeah, that was inadvertently placed in there, so Thank you. my apologies. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's optional. <laughs> right. I have a question. Uh, yes, Lynn. <clears throat> so I'm just kind of curious. Uh, I know you're looking at apartments and, and that type of housing going in sooner than later. What, what's your outlook for single-family homes and townhouses? Do you have any long-term outlook for that and when you're going to start putting those in? Yeah, if, if you remember from the PUD, uh, the majority of that will be north of Pillsbury Road. Yep. So um, I would say that's in the not-so-distant future. Um, you know, we've doing, done surveys of the land out there, and uh, now it's a matter of figuring out the layout uh, of those different sub areas. Uh, but we anticipate there'll be more of that in those, in that area. Okay, and, and I hear sewer capacity is an issue right now as well. Uh, how is that gating the project at this point in time? Uh, very good. So um, we always knew that there was eventually going to have to be um, accessibility to sewer in Manchester to serve uh, the west side of the project. And so uh, thanks to a grant from uh, Congressman Pappas's office, which the town was able to uh, obtain, um, it's uh, made the fe feasibility of doing such uh, quicker uh, a reality. So when I mentioned about courting with the town finalizing an agreement uh, for sewer capacity, that's what we're working on. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Jason and then Ted. Um, I, I just got to say, I'm, I'm kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm kind of disappointed in this. Um, you know, it's going on 10 years now, and we're still hearing, yeah, we're almost there, we're trying, we're almost there. And, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, seeing Bedford and Salem kicking out press releases every couple weeks with something moving in there. And uh, they started after us. And we're still seeing these presentations of almost there, we're really trying, we're really trying. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm afraid we're going to be here five or six years from now hearing we're almost we're almost there. We're right on the edge. And uh, it's 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 pretty uh, it, it's kind of, it's kind of embarrassing driving down there and just seeing this giant field for the last 10 years. So, um, yeah, don't necessarily have a question, but just uh, I'm, I'm I'm disappointed to once again read pretty much the same PowerPoint that we saw last year. Well, I, I, my own opinion, I, I, I think it's moving. Uh, I think the expectation was a little, a little quicker, but it, I think it's better to have something move uh, slowly and something you can, uh, you know, spend time in how everything fit, fits together. We, we have had the opportunity, especially with the building design, to really work, uh, work with them and uh, with, uh, you know, the master plan that is for, for Woodmont. Um, my, so my, my concern is that while we're moving slowly, the other developments around us aren't, and they're taking the. No, I think uh, some, some of that is their their publicity, not uh, it, what it's actually going on. I know Bedford has had problems. Know if, you've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so. if I could just add a comment about yes. that. Yes. So, um, I, I don't disagree with the pace at which Woodmont is or has been moving, but I can tell you, um, myself, the town manager, the engineering department has been working daily to address the primary issue that I believe is um, part of why this is moving slowly or slower, if you will, than other uh, similar projects in abutting communities, and that is because of the utilities and sewer specifically. So I think that the town um, receiving this, this grant that Mr. Smith mentioned is a, a major step, um, and I think that will lead to um, seeing more projects come to fruition quicker in the coming years. Um, that was not even on the table um, over the last 10 years. So I think that that's a significant improvement. Um, certainly would we have liked to see it move quicker? Absolutely, but um, I can tell you that we're working on, on that daily at, at Town Hall with, with the developer, so. Now is that on, on, the, on the positive oh. side, I think it's the 
I think it's a positive to have you on it now. I, I appreciate you saying that, Jason. I appreciate your comments about it too. Um, you know, as, as someone first and foremost, who's a resident of the community and again, having worked on this for so many years in, in my official capacity here. Um, and, you know, it's, it shouldn't be forgotten that there, there was a significant amount of investment in infrastructure that had to go in just to make it possible for, uh, you know, whether it's roadway widenings for traffic, um, the sewer infrastructure, the water infrastructure, all of that, because it's such a massive uh, development. And uh, to Kelly's point, um, you know, there's been over the years the question of sewer capacity and how do we figure that out. And now we're close to the finish line on on doing just that. Um, I will tell you, I know because I heard it so many times when I was town manager, uh, you know, can't we get some more restaurants in here? Um, I'll tell you the the biggest issue right now for restaurant owners, and we've talked to a lot, is uh, first and foremost staffing. Uh, I've had so many say to me, Kevin, I can't even hire for the ones I own, let alone think about doing a, a new one. Uh, and then just the borrowing costs right now for capital expenses. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not, you know, aggressively pursuing these things too. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have the uh, same issues as far as sewer on the east side of the property or would that be easier because of its relationship to dairy? Uh, it's it's a, kind of a separate agreement, not a separate agreement, but a separate issue uh, and in terms of delivering sewer to that area. Uh, so we've just started doing our uh, analysis of the sewer flow uh, in the existing pipes in London Dairy Road. And, uh, you know, we're working on that concurrently, but concentrating first on getting it set on the west side and then we'll look at the east side. Okay. Now, um, the exit 4A and um, the issues with the rail trail um, they're having, does that impact um, you, uh, Woodmont? right now? Well, uh, certainly we hope not. Um, you know, there's the issue of the, the configuration of the trail, which is in Derry, right. not in London Derry, though it's connected to the London Derry Trail. Right. And uh, what we have said is um, we don't care what the configuration is. What we care about is it not being delayed and causing a delay. Uh, and DOT has been driving the bus on this. They have given their preference so that the project won't be delayed. And so we're letting them take the lead on it. Okay. Yep. I know it's, it'll, it's within Woodmont, also a portion of that rail trail. Right. So I'm hoping it's not delayed. Okay, you all set in? Yes, I am. Thanks. Hey, Ted. Um, I know, you know, build out is very important, but also another part of the plan was to have recreation within the, the plan on the west side. Um, I'd hate to have that be forgotten within the plan area if there's hopefully been some internal talks on your side on that. Um, and I think another thing that would be helpful for the plan going forward is probably some signage like welcoming to Woodmont. You know, people know this is now Woodmont. You're driving into Woodmont, you know, on the Michaels Way area, the on the Pillsbury side of things and on the Ash Street side going into Derry, I think having some signage would be very welcoming, having people know, oh, this is, isn't just some buildings going up. This is a whole development. I think having signage for you guys at some point, especially with your logo, would be uh, quite beneficial. Any more questions? Uh, Jake has his hand up, and then uh, I'll do Gianni after Jake. I just wanted to kind of echo a little bit of what Kelly just said. Um, I won't repeat it all, but I think echoing it, echoing it's pretty important, especially the sewer capacity. Um, and I am pretty confident that you'll see a lot of stuff uh, start to move forward in Woodmont here. You know, you start to have some bigger users, such as Derry Medical Center, and we have a set of apartment buildings that are going to come in. You know, I, I think that's going to kind of really get the ball rolling when people start seeing that type of thing come in. They want to start to become a part of it. Um, so, well, it has been slow. I, I do have to totally agree with you, Kelly, and I, I think we'll see some good progress here in the next two years. Yeah, I think it's laying the foundation to it. To yeah, have exactly. have a good foundation to have a good project. So. Exactly. Johnny. Yeah, and don't forget, we had this little thing called COVID. 
which kind of crushed res restaurants and a lot of the retail, and nobody really knew how to deal with it for a long period of time. Just had a question. How many units are in eat on average or in each one of your residential or your multifamily buildings? Well, I mean, Wood Partners, uh, they are proposing 264 in their development. Is that one building? Oh, no, you're talking about in each building. Yeah. Oh. Isn't it like 20? I was going to say, I think it's 24, 24. right? Yeah. yeah. And our current site plan restrictions, I think, are 18, right? The PUD is different. It's what? It's different. It allows for 24 per building. Yeah. I was just, I, I was thought they were much bigger. I was just going to say, if you had to adhere to the current regular regulations that weren't so allowed yeah. for in the master plan, could you afford to do it? But. <laughs> right. What's that? It's a developer Where, that's, it's another developer that's doing it. Yeah. All right, never mind. I'm going to pass on the question. <laughs> any, any more questions from the uh, board? <laughs> No, just, yeah. Uh, getting back to Ted's question about the uh, signage, sounds like a good idea. Uh, I'll ask the staff, is that something they could be allowed to do with our signage regulations? It's spelled out in the PUD. It, there are regulations in the PUD that allow for signage. We just need to consider where exactly we're talking about and go through a typical review process to see what's feasible in terms of signage, but it is allowed by okay. the PUD. Okay, sounds good. That's all I have. Yeah, the PUD has its own master plan, its own development plan, and it's unique to just the PUD. So, and it even goes down to uh, subdivision and site plan regulations. All right, I have one other question for them. Yes, Ted. With the change in the economic times, especially with how COVID has affected everything, would it be potentially a, requ a request at some point from the development to increase the residential units within the plan is that is really a lacking item within new hampshire and southern new hampshire of apartments housing um and as well you know what could also move the project forward yeah i mean it's been 10 years you know since the pud was passed and it's probably not a bad idea from time to time to review it um, just to see what market forces you know are doing the thing that's probably suffered the most um, from COVID was office. Mm -hmm. And if you recall, the PUD calls for a significant amount of uh, office space. Uh, and, you know, that's hard to, to come by willing users now to construct new office space. Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, sure, residential is, is hot right now. It's, it continues to be um, lacking in southern New Hampshire. Um, but you know, that uh, could be part of just a, maybe a greater conversation at some point. And would it also probably maybe benefit the project of increasing the number of units per building and potentially the heights of buildings so that you can fit more units per acre? Potentially. Uh, yeah, potentially. <laughs> we probably, probably have to reopen the, uh, the PUD. The, the, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, it's been over 10 years. I think it really needs to be reopened at this point. Yeah, I mean, the right. economics have completely changed. Yes, yes. And uh, we have to also redo our town master plan, too. We, we do, to, yes. Uh, because then, uh, well, actually, we started uh, with the uh, PUD in, in uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. And master plan finally, finally made it. It was a good good effort. Ari was part of it, and some of this board was mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. It took three years to come up with something uh, that was uh, workable for uh, for all parties. Yes, and I think so, if we uh, want to stay as a com competing force in the region, yeah. we need to have this but, be But two years of that, we were working on our own master plan. For Agreed. Also, so there was a uh, togetherness, not that there's a lot of uh, identicalness between them, but uh, they were worked on together with the vision at, at that time. And the uh, state's recommendation for uh, visit visiting master plans is 10 years. Correct. Uh, approximately, so. We, uh, we're due. Hmm. We have started the, uh, the planning on it and how we're going to do it uh, right now, I think, uh, depends upon our staffing and everything. So mm -hmm. that is a, uh, you know, a rate determinant. So, Ian. 
Well, I put, I, I'll put my two cents in for retail because I'm looking for something that the residents of Londonderry can go into Woodmont and um, use, um, not just medical office, offices. That's great because I'll probably be going to one um, that's already in there who's moving over. But, um, but uh, retail, com commercial things so we can come in and enjoy it. Make it that community, that destination point for other people, too. That's what I'd be looking for. And I think we agree. I mean, maybe a distillery would, to go along with the old Rome Trail, so. <laughs> okay. and, if, and if any of you have any questions offline at any time, I think you know how to get a hold of me, so yeah. don't hesitate. I see to do Spindel, so. uh, I Associates is advertising uh, on their Facebook page. Uh, the opening of the new facility, uh, Dairy Medical Center at 50 Michaels yeah, uh, right. Way on the 1st of May. It's coming up. <laughs> is, it, is it set for May 1st, the opening? May 1st. Okay. Whether it'll happen or not, I have no idea, but that's uh, what they're saying. But Bruce? Uh, so I had a question, Kevin. You said that um, the Baldwins has a waiting list and they want to look at their that they're going to start their second phase. Do you know how big that waiting list is, and is it a big enough waiting list that they're going to potentially look at constructing an additional phase on top of the two that they already have? No, I don't think that's their plan. Um, you know, it was always planned in two phases, <coughs> the, the bulk of it in this first phase and then the, the last 30 or so units in the, uh, the second one. Um, I just, I don't think they anticipated it to fill as quick as it did and to have a waiting list at this point. Uh, and so the word they've given me is uh, in their timeline, that's going to come sooner than they anticipated. With no um, additional thoughts of expanding because of the demand, demand of the product? Not that I'm aware. Okay. okay. Board all set? Great. Well, thank you very much. All right, thank you. We appreciate it, and uh, good luck. Good seeing you all again. <laughs> thank you, Art. Uh, what we're going to do next is uh, we're going to do an administrative board work to get that done. Uh, there are no minutes to approve at the moment. Uh, we have no regional impact determinations. And uh, I know Kelly has one item she just would like to discuss with the, the board for uh, board's input. That's, uh, Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just something for the board's awareness. Um, the property 148 Harvey Road uh, currently has an existing approval for a 3,600 square foot warehouse office building. Um, so far on the site, a uh, foundation has been poured and all drainage has been constructed in accordance with this approval, which um, I should say was approved back in around 2006. Correct. Um, the property was recently purchased by uh, the business across the street, uh, DDA Services, um, and they'd like to move forward with construction of the building and make some minor changes to the site. Um, those changes include actually a reduction in parking um, and then adding additional landscape to make sure it's compliant with our current standards. Um, I think the important points to this is that <coughs> there are no um, significant changes, uh, changes that at least staff feels need to come to the planning board for approval. It's something that um, we believe can be handled administratively. Um, so again, just more of an awareness item um, in case you see in the near future activity on this site. Uh, and then if you have anything to add. That's good. How does the board feel? Uh, do you want staff mm -hmm. to handle this, or do you want it to come before the board for a public hearing and a broader notification? I think it's so minor the staff can handle it. Yep, I agree. Okay. I would agree. Is this a lot next to, like, Wire Belt? Just right. south of Wire Belt. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's something the, the staff could certainly handle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the board is in agreement with staff. and uh, We'll proceed uh, to uh, anything else, Kelly? Uh, that's it. Okay. Or I'm sorry. Uh, uh, just a reminder about the uh, May meeting. So oh, we, we yes. were um, supposed to have a joint meeting with the Heritage Commission, uh, but given the continuances 
um, that occurred from last meeting. Uh, and after talking to you, Mr. Chair, uh, I think June 14th would be a more feasible date to have that Joint Heritage Commission meeting regarding the lookbook. Yeah, I think it would give the commission and the board more time to do with their, uh, their homework. So yeah. that's uh, all right with the, with the board. <coughs> yeah. we, we get a fairly busy schedule on, on the 10th for right now. So we don't want to load things up too much. Uh, you don't have, uh, I don't have any, anything else. So we'll uh, move on to our um, old business, which is a public hearing on an application for a formal review of a lot line adjustment plan to adjust the lot line between 7 Chartwell Court, tax map 3, lot 45-61, zone agricultural residential 1, and 11 Greeley Road, tax map 3, lot 165-1, zone agricultural residential 1. Diana F. Walters' Revocable Trust is the owner and the applicant, and this has been continued from the March 8th, 2023 meeting. And I know at that meeting we uh, had a waiver uh, in regards to uh, site distance, and uh, there was uh, some discussion with, with the board, and uh, it came down to was probably the, the, the cost of for the applicant to you know, determine the, uh, you know, the applicability of uh, you know the site distance that they have to do correct so uh, I think the applicant has been through the whole process uh, what I'll do now is, is go to staff and the board and then I'll let the applicant speak uh, if they, they so desire thank you mr. chairman as, as you indicated again staff did work with the applicants and uh, survey and have uh, looked at what would be required for them to, to uh, shim and overlay that portion of Chartwell Court in order for them to get the site distance and that that number is about twelve thousand dollars so if I could just kind of refresh everybody's memory of, of what when we're talking site distance there's, there's two different types of site distance there's the intersection site distance when you're in let's consider a straight road so your height of your eye is always at three and a half feet you're sitting in in the vehicle and what you're looking at when you're at the intersection or at your driveway, you're looking at a, an object to the left at 250 feet and to the right at 250 feet. And that object is at four and a quarter, four feet three inches off the pavement height. So what you're really seeing is the top of the car coming. So you're sitting there, you see that, you don't pull out. Because within that 250 feet, that person would be able to stop without T-boning you. So that's, that's your intersection site distance. The site distance that, that uh, it's always problematic, particularly in these older uh, neighborhoods, this, this subdivision, uh, this portion of Chartwell um, and Windsor Boulevard, this was constructed back in like in the 86 time frame. Since then, again, when our regulations were uh, revised back in 2000, 2001, we, we looked at to make these neighborhoods safer we we created the stopping site distance so again you're you're driving on the main line you're again your height of your eyes at three and a half feet and you're looking at an object that's six inches off the, the pavement the idea is we always call it the ball because the kid is running after the ball so you should be able to stop in that within that 250 feet so that was that was something that was adopted back in 2000 2001 Today's, so I, what I did is I did a little more research and I looked at, so what are they looking at now? What is AASHTO looking at? American Asso Association of State Transportation Highway Engineers. Nowadays, they're looking at an object that, that's two feet off the edge, of, that's two feet higher uh, from uh, on the edge of pavement. So as you can see here, what ends up happening, if you see, we're, we're about where 250 feet, because again, it's the travel way of the vehicle as it goes around. That little red dot there, that's about where that object is. And what ends up happening, and again, this, this is higher because if you remember, when the, that van goes around, the eyeball's at the top, so it's about eight feet off the, the pavement. So when you're sitting down, what ends up happening is that you don't see that object. So in order to, to rectify the problem is, again, is shimming that roadway about four inches, thus the $12,000. So staff and we've looked at it, and I, again, I think staff's recommendation is on some of these older subdivisions where, again, the, the road wasn't 
design, the, the regulations weren't as stringent as they are today. We look at this and we say, let's use the two foot <coughs> height of the object height at the edge of pavement. We're gonna, we would still keep with the six inches on some of these newer subdivisions because again, it's for safety. We can be more stringent than ASHTO requirements, but so that's our recommendation. So where they've asked, the, the applicant has asked for the waiver. We would support the waiver because he does, he would get the site distance or yeah, w w the, he's asking for a waiver from the existing ball height of six inches and making it two feet, he, he gets it. Staff would support that waiver request. I hope that was clear enough and without getting too technical. Because again, it, <coughs> so this is, a, this is a straight one. Then we always have the ones in the older roads where we think of Adams Road, trying to see out Adams Road, looking to the left and looking to the right. It's particularly if you're on the outside, you're on the outside of the curve. Mm -hmm. you, you, don't, you just can't see around. So again, it's, it's always for safety reasons. That's why the regulation is as such. That's all I have. Okay, anything to add, Kelly? Okay, uh, I'll go through the board and then uh, we'll go to the public and then the, uh, the applicant's uh, engineer. So, Ann. I have no questions. I've asked John about it already, so <clears throat> okay. I'm all set. Jason. No, nope, all explained. Thank you. Ted. I am all set with this. Lynn. No, nope, I'm all set. Yeah, all set. Yoni. I'm all set as well. Roger. I'm all set also. Okay, Bruce. All set. John. Jake. I'm all set. Thank you, John, for the explanation. And any any questions from uh, our applicant's engineer? Uh, so maybe maybe come up to the yeah. microphone just <laughs> identify yourself for our records, please. So we so we have a, have it recorded. <laughs> Understood. I, I should know better. Uh, my name is Mark Sargent, and I'm here representing uh, Miss Walters. Miss Walters is with me uh, this evening, and uh, I guess we're. Uh, John did a, a good job explaining it, and if everybody's all set, I don't want to muddle the waters anymore. I, I just hope you understand that my client, you know, for a simple lot line adjustment, just couldn't absorb twelve thousand dollars to to do this. So, yes. But thank you. You're welcome. Are there any butters? Are any members of the public have any questions, comments, and concerns in regards to uh, this lot line adjustment? I do not see any. Uh, we have a very good explanation. I'll bring it back to the board, and uh, we need to grant the waiver and then uh, go to the plan itself. Mr. Actually, Chairman, I'd actually, like to make a motion to grant the applicant's oh. request for three waivers as outlined above per staff recommendation dated April 12, 2023. Second. Okay, motion made to say, uh, second by uh, Jake. Uh, three waivers, is that correct, John? Yes, it is. Yes. Three waivers, correct. okay. And that's what the uh, motion was for. So just getting a clarification. Any discussion by the board? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Extensions, share is affirmative. And uh, the waivers have been granted. So we'll go to the plan itself now. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to grant conditional approval of the lot line adjustment to adjust the lot line between 7 Chartwell Court, Map 3, Lot 45-61, Zone AR1, and 11 Greeley Road, Map 3, Lot 165-1, Zoned AR1, Diana F. Walters, Revocable Trust Owner and Applicant, in accordance with plans prepared by Richard D. Bartlett and Associates, LLC, Dated August 2022, last revision February 27, 2023, with the precedent conditions to be fulfilled within two years and prior to plan signature, and general and subsequent conditions of approval to be fulfilled as noted in the staff recommendation memorandum, dated April 12, 2023. Second. Okay, motion by Al, second by Jake. Uh, any discussion by the board? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those uh, opposed say nay. Abstentions, and the chair was affirmative, and you have a conditionally approved subdivision plan. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving along here. We have a conceptual uh, discussion. Uh, conceptual discussion is just that, it's a uh, concept. Uh, an exchange of ideas and there's no decisions uh, that are made on this. So the conceptual review a non-binding discussion of a mixed-use development including 
residential multifamily units, retail, a daycare, and phase construction of multiple manufacturing buildings in the Industrial 1 and Industrial 2 District, 6 Secure Away, Tax Map 28, Lot 31-6, Grenier Field Road, Tax Map 17, Lot 2-5, Kitty Hawk Landing Tax Map 17, Lot 5 5, 11 Acura Way Tax Map 28, Lot 31 36. Londonary Holdings LLC is the owner and the applicant. And uh, just identify yourselves for our records, please. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Dick Anagnost, and I'm the co developer of the project along with Grace and Ken Zelinsky, Zelinsky the uh, landowners who are sitting in the rear of the room. Um, also with us tonight are Nick Golan, our illustrious engineer from TF Moran, and um, <laughs> Scott DeLome and, and Jamie Neer in the, also in the back of the room, and they're our architects at this point. So this is the beginning of our development team. When we come back before you, we'll have a bigger team to present because of the size of the project. But for tonight's meeting, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to allow us to share our vision with you and get any feedback we can from the board as we progress forward in the process. Yes, this is a, uh, I think, a, a neat vision. This is my, my own opinion right, right now. Uh, our Southern Hampshire Planning Commission has seen one uh, that is uh, in, uh, in Durham where a uh, developer has built housing for his employees. There's daycare, uh, there's a gym there, and I think it's, he's also doing uh, work. Uh, it's a husband-wife team in uh, Dover. And it's a terrific idea. He's speak, going to be speaking. I can't remember the, the gentleman's name. He's going to be speaking before there's a, a meeting coming up toward the end of the month, uh, or the actually end of May, of uh, all the nine regional planning commissions in the state of New Hampshire. So it's uh, a very interesting concept. And it kind of reminds me of uh, back the uh, the old mill days in the late 1800s. So. Stealing your thunder. You hit sure. the nail on the head, Mr. Chairman. What old is what is old is new. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like going back. I know th this has been discussed with the the commission uh, several times, uh, and uh, it's coming here actually for the, for the first time. And uh, what worked in the uh, 1880s is uh, probably potential for working in the uh, the uh, 21st century. Yeah. And so yeah. You know, you have the floor. I'll and by out. way of another successful project, I can point out is we did the same thing in Bedford, New Hampshire. If you people know where the Copper Door is on Route 101, oh, yeah. that was the village concept. It included the retail in the front, which was the Copper Door, the liquor store, the Dunkin' Donuts, and the bank. And then we had a congregate care component. We had a daycare component. We had a um, office and manufacturing components, and we have a residential component there. And it's been very successful, all clustered together on, on the same side, um, which is essentially what a village is. I mean, a village concept is um, uses that support each other, all co-located, even though they may not be zoned appropriately for that area. So uh, the mills, as you pointed out, were exactly the village concept. They built the mills, and then they built the housing around them for the workers to support the mills, to work in the mills, and then they built... The retail around that, which Manchester is the perfect example of, you had the mill yard, and then you had Canal Street up was housing, and then Elm Street was the main commercial thoroughfare. So, again, you astutely pointed out that, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just bringing it into modern times. <laughs> yeah, so. what worked then works now. <laughs> I'd like to take a quick second note to explain a little bit of history that goes behind this project. So... Ken and Grace Solinsky founded Insight Technologies, which has been in Londonderry forever, back in 1988, literally with one employee out of a basement, which grew the, they grew the company to over 1,100 uh, employees and developed and built Insight Technologies on what was formerly Evans Technology Park and then Ferrotech Park, and ultimately um, it's located on a Kira Way in the north side of town and ultimately sold out to L3 Communications in 2010, which still operates there. So this is the property directly behind it. I myself have developed a couple of high-profile projects <coughs> in Londonderry, uh, EFI on the airport, the um, Elliott Medical Center down on Buttrick Road, 
But more importantly, just to give, take you back, I was the original developer in 1988 that was brought on by Evans Enterprises to develop the parcel that's directly in front of this one, where Insight Technologies was located. I built the old Dexter Chemical, which is now Admix. I built the Caraway, so I'm really familiar with it, and it's kind of taken me back to my roots because it was my first industrial project in my career to ever get done. So um, by moving on, um, the project that we're talking about essentially runs from Akira Way, where we'll have an entrance up to Kitty Hawk Drive. And I'm going to let Nick get into the technical portions of the presentation, but um, we're 75 acres in size. And, you know, really, if you want to talk about a village concept, Londonderry was based on a village concept, and we're in the north where the village was. And, you know, the Ennis Grain Lumber Mill was located in the north end of Londonderry, and it was known as the village, and it employed a significant amount of people. And as it employed more people, workforce housing developed around the village. It had a general store, and um, we're kind of proposing the exact same development with Envision Technologies being the um, core of the development. This, the centerpiece is a 263,000 square foot industrial building, which will house Envision Technology, which is Ken and Grace's newest optics business, and will include R&D and manufacturing. Uh, Envision Technology is an innovative company focused on developing and producing electrical op electro optical systems, which helps customers detect and see and locate their targets. Essentially, they're a defense contractor, just like L3 Harris is. Envision the Envision building will be built in two phases. The first one will be 152,000 square feet, and later on there'll be an additional addition of 111,000 square feet, which Nick will describe further once we get to that point. At full build-out, the facility will employ 1,300 people, roughly. Um, it's important to understand the, the demand that we'll be creating for the other uses that I'm about to explain. And um, it'll create about 1,100 new jobs in Londonderry. The second component, and one of the most important components of the overall village concept, is the residential housing. We're proposing 303 housing units spread over seven buildings. The largest challenge, as you guys mentioned earlier, facing employers in New Hampshire is attracting and hiring workers due to a lack of housing. And as you pointed out, Mr. Chair, if you can provide the housing as the employer, you have a leg up on hiring at this point. Um, we're in the north part of town, particularly where there are very few housing units, so therefore developing the housing around the industrial building makes sense because we can utilize the housing to attract employees and we can give them good clean housing and it's a walk to work situation. You live, work, play. Um, we're going to propose in this a mixture of workforce and um, market rate housing. And the reason for it is because we have, they have line employees all the way up to engineers. So at roughly a 60% of median income, Londonderry's current median income as of today is $126,400. That translates into, in a workforce unit, a single person could make $53,000 and <coughs> live there. At 80% of median income, it's $80,000, which directly correlates with the salaries of our entry-level engineers that we'll be hiring to work in this facility. The next largest challenge <coughs> is the third component of our project is daycare. As we all know, daycare in our state is severely lacking, and as an employer, if we can provide daycare, we once again have a leg up on hiring really good employees. So we can offer them good wages, a good job. The manufacturing is good, clean manufacturing. It's optics, so it's not heavy industrial. Um, they're well-paying jobs. We can offer them a good, clean place to live where they can literally walk to work and recreate. We're going to be proposing walking trails and bike paths and sidewalks for interconnectivity. We can offer them daycare for their children, which kind of leads into the next portion of our proposal, which we understand that we may not be zoned for, which is a retail center. The retail center is about 15,000 feet. Londonderry Village was built around a general store. This will be the same kind of concept. It's a general store. 
It'll have some sort of food use that serves breakfast and lunch. It'll have a wide range of convenience items. Um, it will accommodate, like the old style general stores did, cafes, um, lunch, breakfast, maybe a barber salon, a gym, as was pointed out from when the other one, so that the people that live and work at Inc or Envision Technologies, that was a Freudian slip, that company's no longer with us. Um, <laughs> They'll have a place to go and be able to accommodate their immediate needs or their convenience needs without ever having to leave the site, which essentially takes cars off of um, off of the roads by allowing us to go forward with that kind of a concept. Um, lastly, you know, you may say 303 units is a high density, 15,000 feet of retail. Well, we have a fairly aggressive project which in addition to what I've already explained will ultimately include some others of the Zielinski businesses, which are the smaller buildings that you see. Um, we'll be accommodating a machine shop at 7,500 square feet, a molding shop at 4,500 square feet, and another 7,500 square feet for another little company they have called On Point. So those, have come, those jobs haven't even been calculated into the number that I gave you earlier, so there'll be additional people, but in addition, you have L3 Communications right next door, Inselectro, Kluber Lubrication down on Kitty Hawk, Wire Belt, NS1, Admix, which is the building I built down in front, without even considering the other businesses that are on Kitty Hawk, Harvey, Harvey Ricker, Tinker, and Abbey Road. So the demand for the product that we'll be putting forth will not just be met by us, but we could be helping other industrial in, um, employers in our area. Uh, so that being said, I'll turn, I'll stop the history lesson and turn it over to Nick for the technical presentation. Thank you. Actually, I've heard a history lesson from John Clayton, at, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how the mills uh, formed and everything and how, how they developed. And uh, a lot of it was the, the movement of what originally was uh, Dairyfield, the town of Dairyfield, which is uh, Silly Road, uh, uh, east side of, of Manchester, and how uh, Samuel Blodgett from the mills uh, started uh, building them and bringing the wealth of Boston up and creating the mills and how the, the power, political power of the city moved to where it is now. We and share the same source. That's where I got the information for London Dairy Village, its <laughs> development. Well, also, you, uh, we're going to thank you also because it seems like you're the new Mr. Fessenden. Fessenden was the one who built up that business at the uh, station around that area and in the housing. Um, so I... This, I think this is a, a great project. It was seems like something like this was proposed in the master plan for Pettengill Road. Um, so, you know, it's well, good know. that you're providing f in this plan for the workers. Um, you're planning for the businesses and also uh, recreation and uh, even a general store that could be on a corner. You know, that's... Yeah. Old it, it, style, but brought up to modern day times. Yeah, and actually, uh, I mean, going back into the uh, '90s when we were developing master plans, we said we'd like to, you know, a, a village, and we realized in the master plan we had at the time and our regulations, we couldn't create a good old New England village. So uh, we had that part in, uh, you know, at least to create a, a village, uh, you know, district, various places, mostly in, in the North End. And the only thing we have uh, right now that represents that is the Woodmont PUD, because that is what promotes, you know, the uh, the village concept and everything. So, uh, all right, Dick didn't leave me a lot to talk about, so I'll try and be <laughs> relatively brief. But I think it's important to speak to what some of our development goals were. Um, when we started this project, um, beyond the obvious of providing housing for the own workforce, with the residential being located in such close proximity to Envision. Other items that we looked at, walkability. You know, the reality being, you know, for the maximum walk from your house to the front door of your place of business, 700 feet. Um, and that's the furthest possible distance that you'd have the opportunity to walk from the office to the daycare or what we're really considering, you know, neighborhood uh, retail as far as the general retail, uh, general store at, you know, less than 1,000 feet. Like these are all very walkable distances. So what I'll do is I'll walk you through our, our program and try and highlight some of those elements, you know, the connectivity, the walkability, the recreational opportunities. 
Um, you'll see that we do have some paved surfaces. We have our buildings, obviously. There is a lot of green space on this site. Um, that was one of the other primary elements of our development goals, was maximizing that green space um, and trying to the extent practical, limit the environmental impacts. Um, Dick had mentioned the size of the site is approximately 75 acres. We have over four acres of wetlands, not a single square foot <coughs> of which would be impacted by this project. Um, so as we walk our way through the site, as we come off of a Akira Way um, to the left-hand side of the screen, um, so it'd be on your right-hand side as you drive in, would be that general retail area. We felt this was the most appropriate location and in part because of the topography. You know, there are some very steep slopes. Um, there's a tremendous amount of wetlands that are on this property. Um, that lot in and of itself, which would be consolidated with the other lots, is currently in the neighborhood of about two and a half, three acres. It just can't support the type of use that it's zoned for. So we're looking at providing really a self-sufficient community. And one of those needs is a retail area. Um, whether you're getting your hair cut, you're picking up a sandwich, you need a toothbrush, you know, some very simple things that you can walk from your house to go and acquire. Um, directly across the entrance drive would be the daycare uh, at approximately 9,000 square feet. That provides the opportunity not only for uh, the residents of this community, but potentially other individuals in the neighborhood. Um, we know we have Insight Technologies across the street, which would also have the opportunity to utilize that daycare. Again, from a geometry of that lot, and steep slopes and locations of wetlands, it really lends itself to that type of use. <clears throat> um, so we're very proud of the way in which we've been able to lay out those initial elements. Now, as we come off of Akira Way and head south into the development area, uh, you'll see that there is a, a shallow low-lying area that is a wetland. Um, about halfway across that location, uh, we are proposing um, a bridge. What this would be is a, a timber uh, span bridge. So, you know, it's not enough just to get across the wetland without impacting. What we're trying to do is create a feel for this. This is a village. We're trying to create a, an attractive site element with this bridge. So opposed to just being an opportunity to get from point A to point B, we want that to be a focal point. It provides a great opportunity for this um, just architectural element that otherwise we wouldn't have. So that's why we've incorporated that. Uh, it avoids wetland impacts, and it also provides um, just a really attractive element to this project. So as we cross the bridge and come into the, the primary development area, um, we have more of our community building, our clubhouse type area, where there'd be the opportunity for an outdoor patio area, there'd be uh, a dog park, there'd be a top park, and you see a little bit more of a centralized parking area. And that's one of the few areas you're gonna see that outside of the industrial uses, what we've tried to do is really create that village field so that we're not having these large masses of parking. We're really breaking up those areas and then providing that parking in close proximity to the homes as necessary, um, and looking at the aggregate of parking per, per structure. So those residential buildings do vary um, from 27 to 55 units. Um, I think we heard a lot of discussion earlier about making sure we maximize our opportunities with those residential units. Um, I think the, the size of these buildings is appropriate. When we look at it in the context of where they are sited, it's really a, a topographical feature that we're looking at as well. Um, the buildings that are located most centrally on the project site are really three and four story buildings. Three stories on the near side and do the topography of the site. We go to four stories on the back. So as you come into the development, it's not a massive structure. Um, it's in keeping with its surroundings. And then as you work your way to the back, it provides the opportunity to really include more residential units. Um, we, which we know is at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. We are in a housing crunch. How can we put in more residential units, but how can we do so effectively and do it with the topography in mind? How can we blend these uses into the site? Um, just thinking on, on a couple other items. We always talk about our utilities. Um, we will use municipal water. We use um, municipal sewer. Um, Drainage will be a, a difficult aspect of this, this property. It'll be a combination of above ground and below ground storage. Um, and that's one of the project components because we are maximizing green space. Um, in order to have that park type feel, that village feel, um, we'll have to be very creative about how we, we manage our stormwater. Um, one of the other elements that you see on the plan, uh, all these lovely green dots. Um, Landscaping is gonna be a big part of this. The reality is this is a fair area of clearing uh, that will be required for this development. Our intent is to use native species and really a naturalizing <coughs> approach to revegetate the area. 
So by using uh, those more native species, uh, native species, the idea is this can better blend with its environment around it. Um, you know, the other element I'll, I'll just, well, I, I think it's important to speak to, I've, I mentioned the topography, I think I should put it in context with some numbers. Um, from the high point on the site in the northeast quadrant to the low point in the south quadrant, we go from an elevation of 420 feet to 300 feet. So we have 120 feet of grade change. We've had to be very creative about how we site our buildings, how we site our uses. There is a very important reason why the Envision building is sited where it can be. It's the only place it can go. Um, when we look at the topography and how you fit a building of that size, knowing this is an industrial district, that's where it can go. Um, the remainder of this site would require such enormous cuts and fills to try and provide large pads for buildings. It just really doesn't work, but it does very much lend itself to this idea of the self-sufficient self-sufficient community with residential, with retail, with the daycare. Um, just to, to speak briefly, I guess, to the last couple of items, um, Dick had mentioned the, the other uses, which are really kind of spindle out uh, around the site. That's purposeful as well. Um, we've looked at how the phasing of this construction would take place, um, the, the opportunity to come in off of Kitty Hawk Lane to build our bridge, bridge for our crossing to then provide access um, to the retail and daycare components. Um, knowing that the infrastructure in that roadway would be built first, and then we've master planned it such that we can provide the grading and the drainage for those future pad sites, acknowledging that as the business grows, as does the development, and we've provided that opportunity for parking, um, for stormwater management, and all the other necessities that go along with the development. So I'll try and be as short as I can with this. Um, I'm excited to be a part of this project. Just. We always talk about these walkable communities. I, I know we'll probably sit through a lot of the same planning sessions. We say, these are the goals. How do we implement them? Um, unfortunately, the zoning's not set up perfect for this, so we are going to be exploring things with the zoning board. But uh, this just seems like a, a, just a great opportunity for a project, and it solves a lot of what the concerns were that I think we heard earlier this evening. Thank you. Just a couple more points, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes. So. Um, our entrances are on Akira Way in Kitty Hawk. You're going to be able to drive in and around and through. So emergency vehicles have double access to come in and out as we'll have um, uh, entrance and escape for, for residents and workers as well. But primarily the, the thing, what we're proposing here is that all roads that are not Akira or um, Kitty Hawk are private roads. We'll be maintaining our entire development. So there'll be no new roadways proposed for the town to take over. Um, also, with respect to parking, you'll note that there's a future potential parking deck. We don't know what our actual parking demand is going to be, but we've prepared in accordance with the regulations the number of spaces necessary to meet every, every possible circumstance under the ordinance. However, we don't think we're going to need that much parking, but we wanted to get it approved and prepared in the event that we did. And when we come before you, we'll probably propose a scale bag model where, you know, the parking deck, if needed, will be built at a later date. The parking that you see up there in the right-hand corner, corner, again, would be overflow in the event that it was needed. However, we're trying to maintain the minimal amount of uh, impervious surface and maximize the amount of green space that goes along with it so that we can have the walking trails and the, the things that we're proposing for recreation going forward by still keeping a park setting in this village, because villages were essentially created in country settings, so we're trying to maintain our country setting to go along <clears> with it. And that being said, we would love to entertain any questions or any suggestions from the board for us to progress forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I'll do, uh, we'll go to staff for input, and then I'll go to the board for in input from uh, all the members. Uh, John. Uh, we, uh, staff did meet with, with uh, with Dick and uh, and Nick, as well as the team, a few weeks back, and we gave them some input. And again, our direction was to come and introduce the, the project to you people and get some additional input. Mine was more technical, of course. So we'll see what how it transpires. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Yep, so in that preliminary meeting, we did discuss kind of. Um, how this it does coincide with our current master plan um, and the, the vision that was established at that time, uh, which it is consistent with. Um, additionally, we did, we reviewed the relief that would be needed. Uh, so 
as indicated, there are uh, a couple of variances related to the residential aspect and the retail aspect, as well as a special exception. Um, so the applicant's prepared to go through that process with the zoning board um, and then hopefully come to this board, um, of course, after the design review process and uh, move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll do the board. I'll start with uh, Jake. <clears throat> what a nice guy. Hey, uh, um, I think it's a pretty first, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a pretty interesting project. Um, I don't have a ton to say about it at the moment. I, I think it's pretty unique. Um, I do know what you I've heard of the thing up in Dover a few times. I've been trying to think of the name while I was sitting here, but it uh, uh, yeah, I got when I, I, I get know. home I gotta look, look yeah, it up. Um, the brain's not as nimble as it used to be. <laughs> but I, I you know, I think it's I think it's a unique project. Um, I think it's in an interesting location. You know, this is not um, it's not in the middle of Londonderry or in the middle of a bunch of neighborhoods. So, you know, it's not something that <coughs> You know, I would maybe be a little more hesitant to if it was a bit closer to everything, but it's in a it's in a pretty unique location, um, and it seems like it's going to serve its its uh, <coughs> employees pretty well. Um, uh, one question I had up on the top of the screen: <coughs> What is it like? The second cul-de-sac is supposed to follow the blue line, Kelly. What, what, yeah, what am I looking at right so there? That would be a paper road relocation. One of the <coughs> opportunities we have with this development is there's an abundance of paper roads currently. We have some lots with some questionable frontage issues. And consolidating <coughs> all these lots, we're, we're really cleaning up some Yeah, it looks like it's care. like four or five lots. Yep, there's a total of five. It, right? yeah. um, so it's going to have that opportunity to really create some more developable area in concert with it. Um, thank you. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, I, I guess one thing that stuck out to me is that accessory parking lot up there. I feel like it should have some sort of roadway that connects back to a care way. Um, outside of that, I like the idea of daycare. If I have another kid, my daycare will be more than my mortgage. So <laughs> I like daycare. <laughs> so I'm yeah, off that, it's, Mr. Chair. It's important uh, nowadays. Yeah. Have to, uh, Jeff. Um, yeah, no, I very good presentation yeah. um you know thank you for considering londonary for this i think that's i this <clears throat> you know, like um i believe the chair mentioned earlier it does align with our master plan i love the village aspect i love kind of the technology aspect of um you know the, the technical jobs that are going <clears throat> to that would be coming to our community i love that it's up north and not in the middle mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, that's really kind of you know, an exciting component. Um, just because I'm not 100% um, read up uh, during my nighttime reading of regulations and, um, and aspects, what's a water? What was that thing you said? Water? Oh, paper trail? Uh, uh, paper, yeah, road? paper trail. Paper road? Yeah. The, the, Could, paper, the paper roads what are... What is that? The paper roads are roads that have been established to provide appropriate frontage um, but aren't actually built. So okay. we, have, we have a few of those in town, um, but it maintains that the lot itself is constructible. Yeah, I just haven't got to that part of the final. <coughs> Reading so. for the night. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> yes, sir. No, uh, best of luck, and you know, we'll, we look forward to you working with the town to kind of bring this to life. Yeah, we, we try to keep track of all the paper roads, so it's, it does cause problems. <laughs> uh, Bruce. Uh, so I really like the village concept. I like the idea of people working and then living where they work. Um, it gives you a sense of uh, community. Um, I did have a couple of questions. So obviously it's New England and um, occasionally we get poor weather. Um, is there consideration to underground parking because of, um, you know, you get garages underneath your residences that means your car doesn't sit out in the snow which means that when it snows you don't got to go out and move you know 500 cars in order to clear the parking lots um, and would help to reduce the overall uh, impervious um, 
amount of asphalt on the property. So I was wondering if you'd given that any consideration. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. I'll, I'll answer unless Dick wants to jump in. Okay. You know, that, that podium construction gets very expensive. Um, when we look at the nature of what we're building here, we're trying to put the money into making this as attractive as possible and as functional as possible. Um, <laughs> the other element in that we have an abundance of ledge outcroppings <laughs> is that trying to go deeper um, starts to create, again, some cost implications that are become insurmountable to make a development such as this work. And we are trying to value engineer the opportunity for, is there, can we do carports or something else? Because um, we do recognize that, yeah, having that opportunity to, you know, not have to clean off your car in the morning before you go to work is great. Um, ideally, folks will still be able to take the, the trails and the sidewalks that will be cleared so they can walk to work. Um, and that would be part of our, our design philosophy. But no, we have considered that as far as an, an opportunity. And just right now, it doesn't fit within the, the financial goals of the project. But were the, you know, perhaps the concept, like you said, it's all walkable and, and rideable via bikes or whatever. Maybe uh, a parking structure that is off to the side that allows for most of the people to park in leveled parking. And then you could condense the, the buildings to you know, closer, it's big down south, like if you look around like Disney, which is basically, you know, the biggest village concept <laughs> they have, you know, they basically provide for all of their employees and you never leave uh, that area. Um, all of the apartments are nice and clustered together and all of the parking is, you know, quite a ways away because realistically, the only time you need your car, well, you don't even really need it anymore because you can have your groceries delivered, yep. um, but you've only leave the property to, you know, to do something <coughs> outside of the property, but like you said, retail, uh, work, play, you know, you don't have to move your car. Um, I think that that might be something that would be somewhat feasible, but also help to make the property feel more villagey with less parking um, around the buildings. I appreciate um, that feedback. The other thing I was thinking as I was looking here is, um, you know, like, Features that a lot of people look for um, when they live in apartment living, which is like gym, um, you know, like a big gym or recreation area, pool, either indoor or outdoor. Um, those things that are really going to get the kids to go out and leave us alone. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's what daycare is for, Bruce. Yeah. And then daycare down at the bottom. Go of the outside street. and play kids. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that's one of the things that we are really trying to accommodate here is is that green space. It's, and, and one of the things that's not even shown here is the, that opportunity for those recreational trails. The area that falls between um, really the retail and then the residential development um, is, has the opportunity to basically be that playground, mm -hmm. um, to have those interconnecting trails and to be able to create that without, without creating uh, really a negative impact to the environment and the ecology of the area. So that is, uh, you kind of read our mind on that. That is a direction that we are taking with the project. Yeah, so um, my, my kids are spoiled. We live on a cul-de-sac, which they overtake. <laughs> um, but, you know, the ability for, um, you know, tennis or hockey or <coughs> uh, basketball courts, those types of things, um, <clears throat> I think would be uh, nice adds to the property, which would help kind of bring in that outdoorsy feel as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to say is I really like, I know that the retail is not necessarily, a, uh, doesn't necessarily conform with the, um, uh, with the uh, zoning, but, um, you know, I have a, a, um, a family getaway up in, up in Maine, and one of the biggest things that my kids like about that is there's a country <laughs> store, which literally has mm -hmm. everything. You know, you can go in there and get bubble gum, or you can get uh, crawlers for fishing, um, and everything in between, and it really becomes like a social gathering for people in the area to go get a cup of coffee, and then you shoot the, the crap with your neighbors for a little while, and then you get gas, and you go back to your house, so... Um, as yeah, a young man growing up in southern Maine, I, I can probably give you three or four examples of those things that we had, and it is that feel, and it's that sense of camaraderie, it's that sense of community, yep. um, and that's one of those things that I, I think you've heard that those words used a lot by, by Dick and by myself, um, that well, that's what we're trying to create here. We are trying to create essentially a community unto itself. Yeah, uh, so I love it, and, and I'm a big proponent of, you know, um, not all jobs that are lucrative require you to have a, you know, hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand uh, dollar four-year degree, and uh, you know, clean 
good manufacturing jobs that have a, a good wage and this type of an environment is, I think, sorely, sorely needed um, in this part of the country. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, we've become so mesmerized with, you know, saddling our kids with hundreds of thousand dollars worth of, of school debt for no reason. Um, you know, it detracts from these types of jobs. And, and these types of jobs are what, they're basically what built America. Um, you know, it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't the liberal arts degrees. You know, it was, it was, it was good, hardworking people using their hands, building stuff for Americans. So, um, I love it. Um, big support. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Roger. Um, you got a lot of snow to plow. Where are you going to put it? Mm -hmm. oh, dear. Well, the one benefit of all that green space yeah. is during the winter, it <coughs> certainly makes for good places to put snow. Um, it is part of the rationale. So you'll see the manner in which we've laid out our parking, which more or less aligns with a lot of our streets, provides that opportunity for ease of removal of that snow. It's not that you're going to have somebody you know, plowing through these 300 space parking lots with perhaps the exception of the industrial areas. But for the residential, it is more of that village element where you have your parking along along the streets. So they will be able to remove that and then plow it to the end of the end of the street where there will be an embankment and there will be stormwater management areas below. So it gives us the opportunity to redirect that snow melt, which has some of those suspended solids, the, the sands, the salts, and to make sure they get treated appropriately before they, they ultimately either recharge or otherwise are discharged from the property. But no, it's, it's a good point. One of those things that we always run into is we get a great design, then we look at it and go, where's the snow go? Because um, that's, that's part of living in New England. We, gotta, we have to plan for that. Well, I, every, everything that comes to us with a thing has a snow storage area yep. designated. And that was my question. So good luck. Looks great. <clears throat> Thank you. I hope you have jobs for old people like me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. There's yeah. no discrimination. That's right. <laughs> it's Johnny. So I love the idea of creating jobs, um, <coughs> especially for London Day residences. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of industrial going in, which is nice, but a lot of industrial warehouse, which doesn't create a whole lot of jobs. It's good for the tax base. Yeah. It doesn't create a whole lot of jobs. So I compliment you <coughs> and Mr. Zelensky for bringing in um, some attractive uh, jobs. But being in the real estate industry, I know you, it's tough to attract those jobs without the housing. And we have a housing crisis. So I know a lot of people want to go the other way and restrict housing and development. But you need those to get the laborers to do the job. Symbiotic relationship. It's a symbiotic <coughs> relationship. And we miss out on a lot of many, or a lot of uh, good employers because that's a challenge we have, especially, it's, it's especially in the Northeast, so. Um, <coughs> I think, unlike some of the other concepts we see come through that are gonna create all this and the housing and stuff like that, they try to contain a lot of the retail on the site, and you're doing that for the benefit of the folks there, but um, you are building right next to the, the old village, Old Mammoth Road. And um, one of the things that Old Mammoth and the, and the London, the villages right there have struggled with is supporting their commercial and their office and their retail, things of that nature, because there isn't enough demographics there, and this will complement that because you'll quickly run out of that 15,000 square feet of mm -hmm. retail that you have up there. And it'll breathe new life to that village, and that's how it was. The railways used to go through there, the housing was developed there, the mill was there, uh, the, I think it was the old grain, I think it was grain right, right in that, that village concept. But it's not outside, of, the demographics aren't strong enough there to allow for that village to really throw, uh, thrive today, you know. Um, so this is a good concept, it complements it. Um, one of the things I, I heard, I didn't hear probably enough of, was the accessibility, because you actually go down to Kara and 
brand new field, and those are pretty substantial roads, which dump out onto another substantial road, which is Route 28. Um, you know, so it's pretty pretty good. And for any executives coming in, the airport's right there too. So I think accessibility is pretty damn good. Um, and uh, <coughs> the couple of things, though, that I mean are just realistic things, and I hope the town can figure out a way to work with it, is that the building size sizes don't you know there's a limitation as we heard earlier of 24 units per building so how are we going to help with that if we want that type of use what are we going to do to be able to accommodate it do you know how we can get, is that a variance process or what in this instance it it is a variance process just for residential in general um so yes it's a variance process at this time but that's something that uh, we're <coughs> certainly looking at from a regulatory standpoint how can we adjust our uh, zoning ordinance to uh, be more um, accommodating if you will towards mixed-use development yeah. as as mr. chairman highlighted earlier the PUD is really the way to do that at this time but I think there are other opportunities um, for regulation to be changed or put in that allows for just this without um, so much zoning relief needed. Yeah, so my desire would be to work with the applicant to see it, how we can accommodate it because otherwise it stops there, right? Um, and I know like the building height, I thought the building height might be another challenge too, but I think building heights, you folks at the fire department can support four story, four, five story buildings now, right? Mm -hmm. That's not an issue. Um, and then I didn't see any of the, you know, areas to detain the water from, um, mm. and and I, th <coughs> I'm thinking you probably, in order to keep the nature and the trails and things of that nature, you want to not create big fields of detention areas, and you might want to do things that are underground and things of that nature. That's it's a fair assessment. So we're <coughs> we're looking at all those different tools we have in the engineer's tool belt. I think it, I, I do want to speak to two of the elements you mentioned there, building height. You know, in the industrial district, we can go up to 50 feet. Um, and when we talk about the residential use, and this is kind of an oddity in that when you read through your regulations, those unit counts are restricted to the R3 district. We're not in the R3 district. We're in an industrial district. So I'm not saying that it's a workaround, but when you read the ordinance verbatim, that's how you have to do it, there is no restriction on that number of units in an industrial <coughs> district. So by applying for a variance for residential, in this case multifamily housing within that district, um, it, I believe that absolves us of that need. You know, we've got to work through that with staff and make sure that that is the case. But when we read the ordinance, the way in which um, you know it's put together, it appears that there is that opportunity because we're not located in that district where that would typically be built. So by the virtue of um, kind of really going back here and what's old is new, um, it's providing, I think, perhaps this project some opportunities that it wouldn't otherwise be afforded if it was located in a different zoning district. So we're, we're hopeful that that's going to be the case. I'm hoping we can get creative mm. to, okay. to support it. That, that, that's the other thing. I'm throwing it right on the table, saying that if we all want this, we're going to need to be able to work with it because yes, our sir. current <coughs> site planning regulations don't allow for it. Yep. You know, so we have to get creative if if everybody likes projects so far I'm here and everybody does and then I think that if you're gonna retain <coughs> a lot of that <coughs> nature trails and things like that you're gonna get have to get creative with um, how you deten detain the water on the site as well and I don't think our site planning regulations allow for underground um, detention does Under it? underground detention but not infiltration and as Nick says is ledge out there so you can't infiltrate under so so we, we've got our work cut out for us when it comes yeah, to it. And, and I know John will keep us straight, make sure he keeps us level as far as what expectations are. I'm, um, I'm just in trying to endorse some level of creativity to yes, help sir. you guys get <laughs> you. Have, you have height on the site, though, right? Which will help to help you drain water towards. A lot of people think a good flat site is a great site. For a civil engineer, it's the worst site because I can't get from point A to point B <laughs> with my stormwater. Um, everything wants to flow downhill. So. From that element, you know, and where we want stormwater to go and where it's going now, it's going from that northeast quadrant to the southwest quadrant. So I've got 120 feet of grade change to play with. Mm -hmm. um, so I have that benefit, but uh, as John mentioned and as we had mentioned earlier, yeah, there's some ledge considerations. So there, there's going to take some creativity here. 
um, and we're hopeful when we get to the planning board process that that can be realized. Can you store that water underground and then reuse it to? Um, As I said, some potential landscape. creative options. Um, we have a lovely landscape plan that we'll be uh, hopefully moving of, forward with. A lot of green space that needs water. A lot of green space that needs water. So a potential for water reuse is an element. Um, I can't guarantee those, but we've that's that's the true engineering. Um, we're right now we're at a lot of big picture. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this program, at its essence, was agreeable to the boards. You know, th the meeting with staff was one of those first steps. Um, the next step is is more of that hard work of making sure all these components can really work. That's all I got. Good luck with it. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, Al. I don't know how to express uh, my words on this. I think this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I really do. I love it. Uh, just one question. Uh, are these residential units designed for the people that are going to work on site? Yes, that's the, the concept is the, the live, work, stay concept here. So in order for Ken and Grace to attract the talent that they need, we're going to be providing housing options to those people coming in that they're going to be hiring. So they're designed to meet those needs. Um, you have the affordable units that will meet the needs of line employees and the um, market rate units that will need, meet the needs of engineers and executives. So essentially it's a diverse housing plan. It's just all concentrated within the seven buildings. So someone that was not working in the area but was working in the south end of town could still rent one of these units? Uh, yes, we wouldn't restrict it in that fashion now, but the the what I pointed out earlier is there's so much concentration of jobs in that area. I could go out and build triple this number of units and fill it <laughs> in that area of town because there isn't any housing in the north end, but there's a ton of industrial users that all abut this site. So um, right now we're attempting to use it to attract the employees that Ken and, and Grace need. However. If there were open units, we'd open it up to the other industrial users in our area. We're a good neighbor. Ken and Grace have been in the Londonderry since the early 90s. They built a big business here, um, and they've sold that business, but they're coming back to Londonderry for round two. <laughs> and this is kind of their vision, so um, we're here to present it as best we possibly can. Okay, thank you very much. Again, this is awesome, <clears throat> and that's all I have. Lynn. So I don't have a whole lot of insight to add to this. I think it's a great project. I really like it. I think the location of it is, uh, it's a great use for that location. Uh, Gianni talked about access to Route 28 and 93. <laughs> if you go <laughs> west, you right right near the uh, Route 3, yeah. too, going past yeah. the south end of the airport. So right it's- Right across the highway to Route 3. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, they're gonna be exp working on Route 28 starting uh, in a couple of years. Uh, Route 28 from Sims Drive down to the mobile station anyway. Prior to planning then, as far as the actual building, uh, we know how fast the DOT moves, so uh, <laughs> it's usually more of a funding problem. <laughs> but, but at some point in time, 28 is going to be improved as well, yes, and I think that will just help access to the site as well. Long-term plans. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> understood there's some... Uh, regulations that we're going to have to overcome, but I'm looking forward to working with you to do just that. So I think it's a great project. Good. Uh, one thing I'd like to see to your plan, if you want to keep everyone within your boundaries potentially, is a restaurant and bar, or potentially work with the local breweries to have a restaurant and brewery um, on the site. And as well, I think that would be a wonderful, you know, you want to have people conglomerate at the end of the day, you know, you can see everyone at the end of the day. Working hours, you know? Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. At the end of the day. Um, and as someone who's also a, on a board of a local daycare, I will commend you for trying to find the workers to work at the daycare as they are all completely understaffed. And we have a whole room that is not even open because we can't get enough staff. We haven't had any applicants for over a year. So I will commend you for trying to find people. But I would love to see a daycare there. But... There's no one really going into daycare to work those jobs right now. So I hope that you find the people. Was that Ted? Yes. Okay. Jason. Um, overall, I, I love it. I think it's a, a genius attempt to address a whole bunch of issues that we, that we have around here right now. Um, it actually reminds me of what you would see in Europe. 
that 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 mm. kind of a village feel. I I live in that north north end village area, um, and uh, would be jealous about something like this. Um, so is this all going to be built essential uh, other than the area that you specify in phase two? Is this all basically one phase, or is this does like the manufacturing part get built first and then everything around it? The first portion of the um, envisioned building will be built up front because of the way the site lays out and the amount of site work that needs to be done. The majority of all of the site work will be done up front. And then the first units of the housing will be done. And if the commercial gets approved, the commercial and the daycare will be done. And then future phases would include the parking deck, the rest of the Envision building the other small buildings you see out there. So it's going to take a number of years to develop mm -hmm. um, You won't develop all of that housing at one time because it's not necessary to meet the need mm -hmm. But you'll see it coming fairly quickly because with the demand for housing in the area will probably Fill up the housing before the second phase of the building is built right. But right. you know the market will drive exactly what we do But the whole site will be disturbed and all of the drainage the roadways all of that will be Put in up front, and then the next focus would be the envisioned building, but in parallel courses, um, the housing, the daycare, and the commercial would also be being built at the same time. Okay. Um, also, would you be considering like solar or? or yeah, you stole my thunder, Jason. Oh, that was sorry. supposed to be the big finish. <laughs> That's the big finish. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you do it then. Never so, mind. if I may, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so with. Grace and Ken being on the cutting edge of technology, essentially unsung heroes. They've developed some real Star Wars type stuff that our military uses over the years. And um, one of the things that we're looking at is potentially this being the first net zero housing project ever built in the state of New Hampshire. And wow. we've designed the flat roofs and we're going through the exercises now to determine whether it's feasible to be built. But there's a strong possibility that we could generate on site all of the energy needed to support all of those units as well as the manufacturing, commercial, and daycare. Oh, excellent. So um, the stuff I presented up front, I'm relatively certain I can deliver. The <laughs> piece de resistance, I'm not sure I'm there yet. <laughs> I, I, um, I work in marketing, and I, I worked for an agency where Insight was one of our clients way back when, and you guys built some amazing stuff. It was It was super cool to go in there and get a tour, so I'm, I'm glad you uh, decided to come <coughs> and uh, give one an air or another. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Ann? Um, well, looking over the plans, I, I appreciate all you're offering because you, you, you are looking for workers and you're supplying everything they need. That's perfect vision. Um, I do have some issues about uh, what may be to your to the east of the project, you have two AR1 properties, and one <coughs> of them is um, in an apple orchard, um, and it's on conserved land. So be mindful of that because you have a three story parking garage on that side of the property. So if you could do something, I don't know if it's got to be right there or something to uh, minimize the appearance because there is a slope going down from there. So I just hope that you might take that into consideration also. So that's, a, that's a good point. And one of the reasons why the garage would be located there is so you could drive in on the lower level and also drive in on the top level so that we'd really be blending it with the natural topography. Um, so that's, it's, it's a great point. And it's one of the things we are trying to do is to the extent that we can really ingratiate our community into its natural surrounding. So that, that'll be one of the themes that ideally we'll be bringing forward as uh, hopefully this project can move forward. The other part of the community, not just part of your project, yeah. yeah. Thank you. If in fact we're able to pull this off, the architects will win an award on this one based on how we're fitting it into the environment. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking advantage of the slopes, <clears throat> like the 120 feet, we've got the components set so that they're not all at the same level. It'll mm -hmm. be really attractive when it's done because it's not gonna look like just a big mass of construction that went on here. It will literally look like a village. Of course, there's a cost to that because of the amount of ledge that we have to go through 
and stuff that we have to do in order to make that. But it appears that in the end of it, it's all going to be worthwhile because it'll be really attractive with things at different levels, things at different locations, and the site buffers in between them, and still maintain the walkability of being able to go back and forth. What's One of the things that Bruce pointed out is this is a really friendly site, okay, <laughs> meaning there's plenty of room for recreation, there's ball fields, there's potential for the basketball courts, all of that stuff can be developed with it, and the gym is one of the proposal, proposed uses within that commercial development. I'm sorry, Ann, I may have interrupted you. No, that's okay. You can finish your, <laughs> I'm what done. I had to say. I was on a roll, so. Once, once he gets going, <laughs> it's hard sometimes. <laughs> we apologize. But, but anyways, um, no, I hope you consider that and the neighborhood because, you know, um, I'm not sure if, um, how much you can see from below or from the village. I, I also had another question about what type of architecture are you thinking the same as on 114 and, you know, in the Coppador area? No, completely different. We, we haven't fully developed the concepts yet, but they're all going to be integrated into one another along with comparable materials and the residential that are used in the industrial. I mean, um, the architects sitting in the back of the room are a lot smarter than I am, but uh, Ken and Grace have given us a, a mission here to produce something unlike you've seen before. So um, <coughs> it'll be, when it's unveiled, something that you haven't seen before. We're excited well, to see Well, if it. it's that Sorry. different, maybe um, <laughs> the people in the village may not want to see it. But consider the style of architecture and the, the age of the structures and the feel in that neighborhood, too. Did I is the red gentleman a pin in this <laughs> balloon? <laughs> oh, yeah. All set, Anne? Yes, I'm oh, all set. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is terrific. It, uh, it's probably what we've been looking for. I, I thank you for bringing this uh, to us. So it's uh, a good opportunity. I think as uh, Johnny was, was uh, you know, saying uh, that uh, our regulations get in the way where we want to go. So I think definitely we have to be uh, creative. I think we have to uh, work together, and especially with, uh, with staff, to, uh, to get where we would uh, like to go. And, uh, the only thing that I would, would add, uh, somewhere in there could you put like a little uh, shelter for uh, the MTA to come in and service if any, uh, you know, people will uh, utilize mass transit. I'm sure the, uh, the MTA would love to uh, to add it to its roots, uh, probably at, at some point, anyway. But uh, I have one last question: Are there any high limits because of the airport? Uh, no. No, none. Okay. This Thanks. will require filing with the FAA, um, just because of its proximity. Um, but that's a, a more of a procedural item. Was our, was our expectation? <coughs> okay. yeah, I think it's just to alert to what's Thank going you. on, so they don't get all upset. Yep. So. Staff also pointed out that reflective oh, yeah. services. <laughs> solar and that kind of stuff but there are solar other buildings in our area that currently have solar and over and above that i'm sitting with two experts behind me on reflective surfaces <laughs> so they'll probably redesign something new for solar that doesn't have a reflective service but still takes the heat before we get to the end of this project you do have bellavans uh, right nearby that's completely solar right. on top so there should be no issue with the airplanes over there right yeah. but I, I think this is very creative mm -hmm. I think we're going to be creative now and uh, make sure it, it happens. It solves a, a lot of problems. You just put everything together. It's just so beautifully of what is really, really needed. You know, uh, one of the biggest problems we've had. You know, of course, we like to grow commercially and industrially, uh, but then people are required to uh, make a go. And where are those people? Either they live here or they have to come in. So. <coughs> I think this will alleviate uh, some traffic also. Well, we'd like to thank you for taking the time and the valuable comments. We hope to see you after the ZBA. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could ask us any, uh, any questions and certainly uh, work with staff. Uh, any abutters, I would say work, work with them or let them know what's, uh, what's happening. So they, uh, they're not alarmed. I think most of them are probably uh, like this or maybe even want to yeah. work there, you know. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, it's great. Uh, thank you for bringing it to us. Our pleasure. Good day. Thank you for your time. <coughs> Thanks.
Okay, other business. You know, Kelly's working on some, some things. One is our uh, regulations, you know, site plan and sub subdivision regulations, and she's going to be making a presentation to us on where we are at and some discussion on where we would like to go. And, uh, <coughs> anything else you have, Kelly, for our I next? I do not. No. Yep. Uh, we haven't uh, breached uh, tomorrow is the date uh, where uh, plans for our uh, be our May 3rd meeting have to uh, have to be in and we'll have an idea of what will be on the agenda I don't think it's terribly overloaded uh, the meeting on the 10th of May uh, I know we have four continued plans anyway so that will probably keep us keep us busy so if anything else comes along I'll, I'll let the board know and, uh, there's nothing else. I'll take a motion. Motion to adjourn, to adjourn Mr. Second. Chairman. Motion to adjourn by Al, second by Ted. All those in favor, or in favor of adjournment, signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>